Hi, everybody. I hope you had a good final round. Uh, don't worry about the results. The ranking is not official yet. We'll do this after this presentation. Uh, but we're very honored today. We have a very special guest. So from Poland, from the city of Warsaw, we have Kamil Debowski. Uh, yes, yeah, you can clap. <laughs> He traveled all the way from Poland for us, um, and he's going to present on a technical topic. A little bit about him, so he's uh, been doing competitive programming for many years. He's been a finalist in a lot of international competitions. Uh, he has the rank of a legendary grandmaster on um, Cold Forces. And also, he has, to. <laughs> <laughs> and also the rank of target on uh, Top Motor, right? Possibly. Yeah. But at least in the past. Yeah, so he's had that. And he's also been an author of more than 300 problems for international coding competitions. Um, also, he has a YouTube channel where, and please note this, he has more than 300,000 subscribers. His videos have been watched by more than 12 million times. So uh, he, has, he knows what he's going to talk about. And I want you guys to use this opportunity to connect with him, to ask him questions. Uh, to understand the topic and to use this time that we have with him. So without further ado, please welcome Camille Devilski. Thank you for the introduction and let's go with the lecture. I will, during the first few minutes, ask you a few questions. Some of Anybody recognizes the first sequence? 0, 1, 1, 2 and so on. What's the name of that sequence? Just say it. Fibonacci yeah. sequence. Yeah, sure. Fibonacci sequence. Now, the definition of Fibonacci sequence is that every number is the sum of the previous, two, previous two numbers. One is 0 plus 1, and so on. Uh, but it's only one example of many, many sequences that satisfy some linear recurrence. In case of Fibonacci numbers, we have f of i equals f of i minus 1 plus i minus 2. And whenever we have such a formula, actually with any coefficients here next to those numbers, next, next to those terms, say 5 times this plus 200 times that number two indices ago, we say that this is a linear recurrence. Also, there could be more if I erase this, oops, if I erase this, which just gives us a geometric progression, it's still a sequence with linear recurrence. Today, we'll talk about the Bertelkamp Massey algorithm, something that is able to find linear recurrence formula given values, like given those values. And then we'll try to use it and talk about problems that are solvable usually very easily, thanks to that. So, slight, maybe not a difficult question, but I'm curious. Anybody here used Bertelkamp Massey in the past? Hands up. If, if you used it. Okay, one hand. And uh, do you understand what you did or just copy pasted? I think at that point I like, derived it myself, like what it does, like from the okay. like, mass, but I don't remember. From what? Okay. Then congratulations. It took me many, many hours to understand a Wikipedia article because if you read anything, I don't know, any scientific paper on Bergkamp Massey, you will find something about polynomials and it's difficult to understand for competitive programmers unless you have a very heavy background in math. Uh, today we'll not really use that interpretation, we'll not talk about polynomials, we'll just talk about sequences. Uh, maybe... Okay, one more thing. What's a pattern here? Anybody recognizes this sequence? 0, 0, 2, 4, 8, 12, 18, 24. What's the sequence? If you see what it is, you can say out loud. Uh, then what's next? Uh, I see that it's indeed... Uh, actually, it's an important point that sometimes we can have something by coincidence. So that wasn't meant to be a pattern. I can provide then the next element. It's 32, so correct. And then 40. Correct. Actually, okay, now I realize that uh, <laughs> what you gave is also a proper interpretation. 
uh, just for a surprising reason. A sequence that has something special about differences is, for example, linear uh, progression, but also in this case, what I wrote down is halves of squares, rounded down. If we write down squares, 0, 1, 4, 9, and so on, we then write down halves of them, rounded down. This is the sequence. And indeed, the differences here are 7, 9, 11, and so on. But if you divide it by 2 and round properly, we have 0, 2, 2, 4, 4, and so on. So good answer, actually. Uh, now, when we see such a sequence, we can try to guess a pattern. Uh, if it's easy, then we will do it. If it's more difficult, we will not manage to do it. Uh, in particular, if I wrote here halves of cubes of numbers, I think it would be close to impossible to guess it. It's still possible, uh, because it's just a small uh, definition. Uh, okay, now the idea is, given such a sequence, or given such a sequence, we want to create a program that will find linear recurrence for us. And actually, if we know that it's something very simple, then we can try all possibilities. If we have something close to Fibonacci values, so let's say we know that it satisfies such a formula, there are some two first elements of that sequence, maybe just 0 and 1, and we know that every consecutive element is derived using such a formula. A constant factor times previous element plus another constant factor, or the same, times element two indices ago. Uh, we can try all coefficients. That's, of course, very uh, slow, assuming that it's integers. For now, let's say it's integers up to some value. We can just try. We can iterate every C1 from minus 1,000 to 1,000, every C2 from minus 1,000 to 1,000, and we can try if it fits. Now, what's a better way to do it? Usually, when we have variables and we need to solve it in math, what do we do? Yep. Uh, maybe some sort of a Gaussian elimination. Exactly that. We can use Gaussian elimination. And let's write it down for this sequence, maybe. So I want the formula from the top to hold. And I know that the first term that satisfies it is 4. Then I can write down that 4 is equal to C1. Actually, I will call it X1, because X is usually a variable uh, in Gaussian elimination. Uh, X1 times 1 plus x2 times 0. Then, next term, 9, I want it to satisfy something similar. x2 times 1. And let's write one more, because that's usually enough. x1 times 9, plus x2 times 4. I want to find x1 and x2 that will satisfy all of that, this system of equations. Uh, and this should be easy because x1 is apparently 4, then this is 16, x2 must be minus 7, and I'm guessing that this is enough to say that there is a contradiction. x2 is minus 7, if I'm not mistaken, because if we plug it here, 36 minus 28 is 8 instead of 16. So it didn't work. Uh, uh, maybe, of course, I'm mistaken, but it's not so important. There might be a contradiction. What it means is the following. There is no linear recurrence of length 2. We cannot just use two coefficients to represent this sequence forever, at least not until this element. It, which means that we can use a third coefficient or more. And if we write this thing, I don't want to solve this longer system of equations, but again, you can write down a few of them, like 9 equals 4 times x1 plus 1 times x2 and so on. And if you write enough equations, you should get a solution. Plus few extra equations, you can make sure that there is no contradiction, that this solution actually holds. You cannot be certain, because no matter how many elements I provide here, I can then provide the next random element, which will not fit the pattern that you thought uh, holds. But it's about being kind of certain that this holds. So usually we will write down few equations and few extra, like five extra, just to make sure that it's not a coincidence. Uh, okay, what's the time complexity of Gaussian elimination? Cube, yes. 
By the way, if you don't know this algorithm, that's perfectly fine because it's not a prerequisite for what we will do next. Still, who knows Gaussian elimination end up? Most. But again, it's not a big deal because in a moment we'll switch to something else. Then, solution to find a linear recurrence of a given sequence of numbers is the following. Try every increasing length, first maybe just length 1, then 2 and so on. A moment ago we tried length 2. So try length L equal to 1, 2, 3 and so on, up to n over 2, let's say, is reasonable. If you have n elements, then it doesn't make more, uh, much sense to try bigger lengths, I will explain in a moment. For every such L, uh, you hope that every element, like here, is representable by the previous L elements multiplied by coefficients. Uh, so create system of equations, equations, and then find a solution. Or check that there is contradiction, which means that you need to try bigger L. What's the time complexity of this? Uh, well, it will be, we, we try here a lot of lengths, for each of them separate system of equations, and the time complexity is because of that n, that's how many times we try, times Gaussian elimination and cubic, in total n to the fourth power. This can be sped up, so I think some of you should already get the idea. If I want to try, find the first linear recurrence that will work, or the shortest, then what should I do? Say out loud, if you have an idea. Yeah, by nurse. Yeah, uh, would uh, doing uh, n squared uh, also find potent potentially smaller ones because we can put coefficients to be zero? That's right. Uh, so this is explanation why binary search works. That longer linear recurrence also works. For example, for Fibonacci numbers, I can say that every Fibonacci number is the sum of previous number plus previous previous number plus previous 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 times zero, right? Yes? Uh, I don't know whether you'll go to public Yes, I did. And yes, I solved it this way. Then I'm thinking about a different one. There was a task chess night in Bubble Cup around eight years ago. Same, qualification. This task uh, might even work several days on several computers, uh, solve the Gauss elimination for two, three, four, five, and then find solution and end to end up. I think we're talking about the same problem because I already five. Maybe I will get back to this later. Maybe it, it is, I, I just know the two. Okay. Two then we'll get back to exact this exact problem. Uh, right. Uh, so we have n fourth. We can speed this up with binary search to uh, make it logarithmic. Log of n times n cubic. And this is this solution says, if you want to find shortest linear recurrence, shortest is important for other reasons. We'll talk about it later. Binary search the linear recurrence length and then try creating a system of equations. Now, how many equations do we need? Well, that you should know, most of you should know it from math. If I have a system of, uh, with two variables, like here, usually when I have two equations and two variables, I will get one solution. I'm saying usually because sometimes it's already contradiction or sometimes it's infinite number of solutions, amount, and it depends on whether something is linearly dependent by coincidence. Uh, let's say that that's not a big issue and we'll always use a few extra equations just in case. Even if we use a few extra equations, maybe there will be multiple solutions, we want to find any one of them. If Fibonacci sequence is uh, solvable by two different equations, that's fine. We can get either of them. So if for some reason we can say but Fibonacci is always five times previous num number minus seven times previous previous, fine. Uh, and just to show you that sequences can have many, many linear recurrences, talking about Fibonacci numbers, I think that something like this should be true. Fibonacci number is equal to previous, let's say, times uh, minus two, plus two indices ago times three or four, 
and i minus 3 times 3. Uh, I hope I'm not mistaken, but what I did is, in the standard formula, I took fi minus 1 and I changed it using formula recursively. Right? This element is equal to the sum of those two, so we can change a lot of stuff here around. I can also uh, modify this to minus 3, just by increasing both of those by 1. Still a valid solution, and we will say then that minus 3, 5 and 4 is a valid linear record. It's just not the shortest. Questions right now? Um, all right. At the end, we'll talk more about what sequences usually have linear recurrences. And one of signs that this is a case is that something is a polynomial. And here, the formula for this sequence of squares is n squared. Our formula here was n squared divided by 2, which is less regular, but still it's like polynomial a little bit. And whenever for a formula is something like that, it will hold. If I create a sequence that has a formula, and maybe an exact formula, that says fn is equal to n cubic minus 7n squared plus 1, I guarantee you that this will have a linear recurrence of length 3 or less. So if we have here polynomial of order 3, then there is linear recurrence for this thing. Even if you don't know a formula, which will be crucial in solving problems. Because when we saw that sequence, we didn't know a formula. <coughs> and how we will solve problems is, we cannot really solve the task efficiently, but we know that for small n's, those are the answers. We can use brute force to find answers for small n, and then we will plug it into this magical box called barrel camp massing. And it will tell us the, recur uh, the recursive formula. In particular, we can plug Fibonacci numbers inside and it will tell us that this sequence satisfies the sum of previous two elements. Um, okay. And uh, one more thing about how we will use it at the end is that once we have linear recurrence, we can use something close to matrix exponentiation to efficiently find elements that are very far away. But we'll get back to this. Now, this is a good example where I will show you how Berlkamp Massey works, because it's not a difficult algorithm. And if you really want to come up with this yourself, your only hope is to just think that what you're doing is Gaussian elimination, but for a very special system of equations. Right. The equations I wrote down here are not random, but numbers, the same numbers are on the diagonal, so maybe something smart can be done with that. If you analyze this enough, maybe you will come up with an algorithm equivalent to bergkamp massey but that will be difficult. So I'll just show you how it works. Uh, we have a sequence of numbers. Let's say that we already have some linear recurrence up to every point. So for every prefix, I want to know the linear recurrence. Now, if we look here, then what's the formula? Well, 20 is equal to 10 times 2. So up to this point, I could say ai is equal to twice ai minus 1. This notation wouldn't really be convenient for later some more math. So instead, I will write it in the following way. I will use minus, sorry, 2 and minus 1. That will be my notation. Uh, why am I using this notation? That's equivalent rate of writing ai times 2 is equal a2. And if I move everything to one side, then it's this. Okay, this must be equal to zero. That's an equivalent way of saying every next element is double the previous element. And if I grab coefficients from here, 2 and minus 1, and put it here, it looks like nicely, and we can check it when moving to the right. So right now, those coefficients, 2 and minus 1, where minus 1 isn't really a coefficient, it just means that the next element will be compared against. I can move it here, and I can check if the current linear recurrence still works, whether it still satisfies the sequence. 
One way to check it, of course, is to just check if 30 is equal to 2 times 20, and that's not correct. But in code, it will be way easier to check 2 times 20 plus minus 1 times 30, whether it's equal to 0 or not. It's not equal to 0, so this thing doesn't work. And we need some magical way to fix it. The main step of bergkamp masse is if you have an incorrect linear recurrence, how to make it correct. Uh, for, the, for educational purposes for a moment, let's say that we magically know how to do it. And we have this next linear recurrence, which what we should get is this. This is the old one, it worked here. This is a new one, and it works for 30 compared to previous elements. And it just is the same as the Fibonacci numbers. 30 is equal to 10 plus 20, or 0 is equal to 10 plus 20 minus 30. Now, if I move it by 1 to the right, it still holds true. If you sum up with multipliers, you will get 0. And finally, if you move it here, it will not evaluate to 0. This is equal to 30 plus 50 minus 100, which is minus 20. And there is a name for this number. Uh, at least if you read Wikipedia article, there will be a name. It's called discrepancy a difference of how much you are mistaken from zero. Well, you want to get it down to zero. And now Berlkamp masse does the following. It tries to use the old linear recurrence to fix the current one. The memory, the space complexity of Berlkamp masse is just kind of 2 times n or 2 times l because it always needs the current linear recurrence and the previous one something that worked back then and stopped working. It's not a correct one anymore. And what is very useful for that is also, at that moment when the previous linear recurrence stopped working, if we compute the discrepancy, in this case that's 20 times uh, 2 minus 30 times 1, and that's 10. We'll use this. This is old or previous discrepancy. I'll call it old discrepancy. Okay. And now, it turns out that those two things you can treat as equations. When you have a system of equations, usually you can add things together, multiply them, subtract, and so on. For example, if I tell you that x is equal to 7, and 2x is equal to, or plus y is equal to 20, what you can do is you can say this equation minus previous one times 2, so we subtract this one, minus 2, and you will get y is equal to 20 minus 14, 6. We want to do the same thing. And that, I will in a moment explain why we can treat those as equations. But if you want to get this discrepancy down to 0, and you have 10 here, what you need in this case is add the previous equation times 2. So, I will first maybe transform this previous one. And that's 4 minus 2. I know that this evaluates to 20. I took this, multiplied by 2. Now we have this equation. What, what is this equation? It says 4 times 20 minus 2 times 30 is equal to 20, apparently. It's not really... What, is it an equation? I guess so. Just no variables right now. And now we can add those two things together, column by column. Right? It's, columns are very important here. And 20, you can think that is on the right hand side. If I add those two things together, I will get 4 minus 2 plus 1, that's minus 1, 1 and minus 1. And I claim that this evaluates to 0. Well, just like with equations, I added things on the left side of uh, equation, on the right side, and the sum will hold. We can check, of course, now. 4 times 20 is 80, minus 30, that's 50, plus 50, that's 100. And one way to check that it works is that, indeed, it evaluated to the next element. But in code, we will continue with minus 1 times 100, that's 0. Okay? Apparently, it worked. We have 
for now, no idea why it's reasonable. Why does it always give zero? Is it always possible? Is it the shortest linear recurrence? But now we'll try to understand it. Uh, first thing. For two equations, sometimes you cannot get a variable just because those two equations are too similar to each other or something like that. For example, if I said I know, x, is, x plus y is equal to 0, 2x minus 3y is equal to 7, there is no way now to modify this second equation to get 0 on the right. You cannot to this equation, add the previous one multiplied by some constant. Because there is zero here, it will not modify the right-hand side. So, first crucial thing is that the old discrepancy cannot be zero by coincidence or not. But that's fine. My definition of what that is, is that's an old linear recurrence, this whole thing, what I'm marking green. What I'm marking green is the old linear recurrence that isn't working anymore. The reason why in the past we changed it is that up to some point it evaluated to zero, then we shifted it to the right and it didn't work. Didn't work means it didn't evaluate to zero. So we are sure that this old discrepancy is, is non-zero. And thanks to that, we can add the old equation to the new one to get whatever we want on the right. Generally, when you have something like that, something is maybe in way, something is equal to, I will call it old, that means old discrepancy, and something equal to new, that's the new discrepancy. If you now want to say second equation plus equal previous times constant, and you want to get this to zero, then what you need to do is the following. Second equation, uh, you need to add the first equation multiplied by new times new divided by old uh, with minus i think that's the exact formula if you do this this thing will change to zero and i mean this thing multiplied by this ratio will change to new new minus new will be zero if you think about it in gaussian elimination we are doing the same step when modifying some element to zero yes uh, why does this preserve the rec reference for previous elements? Very good question. For now, I didn't say a single thing that would mean, that would imply that it works in the past. And we need to talk about it. What I'm sure about right now is that we will get some equation, some linear recurrence that right now evaluates to zero. But I don't want a formula that will work for a you know, few elements in a row. I want a formula that also works in the past. Yes? I just realized that the, that's because uh, what I, in the past, what am I doing? I'm adding the previous one uh, to the current one, but the previous one is zero, so I'm adding zero to something which is, will still be something. Yes, in the past it was zero. So magically it works. I, I will maybe visualize that. So we know that this thing works in the past for everything in the prefix so far. So even if there were more, uh, more elements here, we know that this up to this point worked. I will note it like that. Then when shifted here, minus one, it was, I will say, non-zero, the old discrepancy. If I shift it to the left by any amount, it still is zero. Then I have that current linear recurrence, in this case 1, 1, minus 1. I will again write it down. 1, 1, minus 1. I know that this is 0, but also it's 0 when shifted to the left. Like that. Right? If you multiply those coefficients with those numbers, you will get 0. And that's also true anywhere on the left. And maybe we will actually write one more case like that. And same thing here. And now I claim the following. When I have an issue here, 1, 1, minus 1 is non-zero. And now I get those equations, this one and this one, then any formally real linear combination of them. 
if this is equation A, this is equation B, anything that will say A times K plus B times T will be zero, uh, will be, well, actually anything here. But when shifted to the left by one or by more, they change into those equations. So what I actually wanted to claim is the following. This A and this B here, they will always evaluate to zero no matter how you modify them. From those equations multiplied by anything, they will give you a zero on the right. I have one more uh, longer visualization. This is not a public blog. Uh, So, if you have a sequence here of 10 elements, A0 through A9, and let's say we had already three coefficients, some kind of old linear recurrence, it evaluated to zero, like up to some moment, and then it evaluated to non-zero. Then we have a new, possibly longer, usually longer linear recurrence, that again, evaluated to zero in a lot of places. Now, when we say something, uh, multiplied by a constant, still, no matter how you multiply it by a constant, it will give you zero here in all those places. So if we add this together, we can claim something. What will we claim? Uh, let's see, to be a little bit more formal. Let's look at things that end at A5, uh, A5, this thing. This, what I highlighted means that Values A2, A3, A4, A5 multiplied with those coefficients will give you zero. Then when we look down, let's look at this formula equation. Um, again, some coefficients multiplied with stuff up to A5 will evaluate to zero. Now, for this formula, just imagine an extra zero on the left. So let's say that this thing you can expand by an extra zero right there. And then you have two equations. The equations are saying a1 times a constant plus a2 times a constant and so on up to a5 are equal to zero and you can just add them up. Um, yeah, or if you, I will not explain that in a lot of detail, but you can write down what exactly are, what is that new notation for the new possibly longer linear recurrence and how every coefficient came from the sum of those two coefficients. Okay. This is why new linear recurrence will work in the past. Uh, what's next? Mm. Berle camp masse what is supposed to find... Uh, sorry, technical issues. What Bergkamp Massey uh, wants to find is the shortest linear recurrence, or let's not be specific, let's say that it's not the shortest, it's a shortest. Bergkamp Massey finds a shortest linear recurrence. I'm writing this down to talk a moment about this a, or maybe any, any shortest linear recurrence. By any I mean, I'm not trying to prove that there is exactly one. If there are a lot of them, that's fine, I will find any one of them. I still want to say that it's shortest for efficiency reasons and for how we will use this linear recurrence later. Because it's not really difficult to find linear recurrence of any length. In particular, uh, I will tell you a stupid linear recurrence that works here. I claim that a valid linear recurrence for this sequence is fi is equal to, maybe not starting with zero. Zero at the beginning is something special. Uh, okay, this thing. I will give you a stupid linear recurrence. A i is equal to 10 times a i minus 4. Well, this works if you check. For every i that is valid, meaning it needs to be at least 4, it will satisfy this sequence. But we don't have enough numbers to check that it will be true in the future, so it's not really valuable in any way. Uh, so one reason why we find the shortest is that we had the best opportunity to check that it's consistent. And second reason is later it will be part of our time complexity, length of this linear recurrence. We say that this is linear recurrence of length 4, just imagine zeros here.
right? Every number is dependent on the previous four numbers. Um, okay, now, why is it shortest? And here, visualization will be nice. So, this is a sequence. And let's say that you have right now, Bernkamp masse at every point found some linear recurrence. Let's say that it found a linear recurrence that uses coefficients multiplied by those four elements. This is a0, a1, a2, and so on. And here we have some free coefficients, 1 to 3 and minus 1. Always it's minus 1 at the end. Now, possibly there is a better one or a different one. So let's say that this is what we found. We have this, or Berlkamp Massey found this, but actually hidden, and we didn't find it, there is something shorter. Something that says this element is the sum of just the previous two elements with some coefficients. Now, it implies something. Just like for all equations, it means that the difference between them also is a valid sequence or valid linear recurrence. Uh, an example, if I say here 3, 4, 5 and minus 1, and here uh, 2, 2, minus 1, now I can subtract those two and I will get the following, 3, 2, 3, 0. I will erase this 0 because it's still true, it still evaluates to, uh, to 0. And now I know that this, when put here or anywhere to the left, is a, lin a valid linear recurrence that evaluates to 0. I want to now transform it a little bit. So I will, uh, I want to get minus 1 at the end, so just divide it by minus 3. Whatever you do with equations, you can do here because it's just an equation. Minus 2 third and minus 1. Or equivalently, this says uh, that element is equal to the sum of those two. So ai is equal to minus, uh, so minus 2 third times ai minus 1, minus 1 times ai minus 2. This is what we realized. So all the possible, possibly infinitely many, linear recurrences ending at some position, the differences between them are usually shorter linear recurrences that were there previously. So if you see any solution, all the other solutions you can get by using all their linear recurrences. If you in some way represented all possibilities up to some index and you knew everything about possible linear recurrences, you will not miss anything here. So now you want to know what is a valid linear recurrence for this longer sequence for longer prefix, it's just different possibilities will differ by something that is a previous, not previous, one of previous linear recurrences. And now a second way of looking at that is if we have something that works or doesn't work, with what we need to subtract it so that it would be as short as possible. Uh, so this thing was a previous linear recurrence that I can mark. It was in this case here. And now, if there is something even shorter, then it's only better. I will want to say the following. If Berlkamp masse provided the shortest linear recurrence a moment ago, then it will be useful now and we will use it to subtract and again get something shortest. So now from the other side, kind of. Again, there is a sequence. There was here a linear recurrence that works. Then we shift it to the right by one to check and it doesn't work. Right? Here, when I put four coefficients with those four elements of the sequence, it doesn't work. This is bad. Now, I'm going to look at this thing that worked until a moment ago and I want to subtract another linear recurrence because I want zero on the right. All the equations with coefficients that have zero on the right are my valid linear recurrences in the past. And if I, for example, know that this is one of old linear recurrences, then I can subtract white from green with valid coefficients, and the new thing I will get is this. Then how do I get this to be as short as possible? The old linear recurrence that I used to subtract, 
this is an equation. This is an equation. I will subtract them column by column, like I've shown you. Then the length of this thing will depend just on you know left point of this old thing and our new right point. So I want this previous thing, the green one, to end as late as possible, as far to the right as possible. So our way to get the new linear recurrence to be shortest possible is to choose such old linear recurrence that starts rightmost. And now, this uh, for a moment, let me get back to what I told you about memory. What our storage will always be this, current linear recurrence, old linear recurrence that starts rightmost, and, you know, the current discrepancy, discrepancy, and old discrepancy. This is our memory, and almost nothing else. Well, you need to keep some kind of index to iterate. Other than the input, you will just store this in memory. I'm saying that not because it's important how space efficient the solution is. I think it will allow you to easier understand the algorithm. Mm, okay, so if we have something that doesn't work in a moment when shifted to the right, I already explained why we need to use a, one of previous linear recurrences, also something that when shifted to the right by one doesn't work, meaning it doesn't produce zero because I marked it here. This thing didn't, couldn't be zero, otherwise we couldn't subtract an equation. Or in other words, this division that we need to perform, new divided by alt, would be division by zero. And, uh, and among those alt recurrences, no matter what we take, we will column by column add them together so what we get here, the start point depends on that start point. So the thing that starts rightmost will give us here the thing that starts rightmost. And nothing else we can do, because if magically this is your current linear recurrence and you try to find something else, you hope that when shifted to the right, something shorter works. So maybe, I don't know, this is fine. I will mark it with a color. Maybe there is some blue linear recurrence that we're missing. No, we cannot do that. This, this is impossible because the difference of those two is again a linear recurrence and it will be something shorter than the green one. If Bertkamp Masse so far provided the shortest linear recurrence, it will again find the shortest. What I said is not a formal proof. I don't think it would be enough to score a lot of points in the math Olympiad, but for competitive programming it's enough. Uh, and certainly, you don't need to understand the proof to apply Barrelkamp Masse. Uh, th this part was for sure optional. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, so how do we initialize it? Um, like, do we, what do we care to start? The, uh, a recurrent like with one element and previous one is zero, or how? Yeah, uh, good question, because I cheated a little bit. When I walked you through this example at the top, I said that oh, yeah, we magically know the first linear recurrence. And then I showed you how using those two old linear recurrences, we can produce a new one by subtracting things around. And it's even more tricky if there are zeros at the beginning, because from zero you cannot get anything else. You cannot say, if at the start of Fibonacci sequence, you have 0 and 1. You cannot provide any equation for that. 1 is not 0 multiplied by anything. So it's tricky. And my recommendation for implementing Bertelkamp Masse is to implement most of it and then analyze what would happen at the beginning. And when you do it, it will become apparent that everything magically works if you, at the beginning, Possibly incorrectly, just say that a of 0 is equal to 1 times a of minus 1. Uh, this is usually stupid, saying that. a of minus 1 doesn't exist, so what even this equation represents. Uh, actually, what we always want is an old linear recurrence that doesn't work anymore, also a new one that doesn't work anymore. And this, assuming that a0 is not 0, 
a0 is not 0, uh, then this is indeed something invalid, something producing discrepancy. And that's what we need from the previous linear recurrence. Uh, you need to be careful about what your code does, but I implemented Bergkamp, must say, in like two different ways. I also saw other people implementing it. And it turns out that kind of however you do it, there aren't any issues about the first elements as long as you assume something like that. I will later show you my code and I will show you how I initialize that. And it's one of those things that it works, so I don't tr I try not to touch it. Can, can we not like initialize with just like a length one recurrence? So just like a minus one instead of a one minus one? Uh, do you mean length zero? Like, yeah, I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah, I... Uh, let me see what I'm doing in code. We'll get back to that when I walk you through the code. Uh, what this is... I think that what I do is indeed both old and previous, I just initialize to that. So, yeah. I, I, yeah, I think you're right. But the what I wrote a moment ago is how I first implemented it and it also worked. Yeah, fair. I mean, I guess like the reason I'm not so sure is because we said that we have the property uh, like the uh, like loop invariant that we always have the shortest ones before. And if you initialize with minus, uh, with one minus one, this is not the shortest one because this one is shorter. So I don't know whether it's yeah, but it's also important how we will use it. And the thing is that this will not be used anyway, right? This is, well, actually well, it will be. This is a minus one. Non -zero, it can still, uh, like produce a non -zero value, right? You're right. Yeah, I, I agree. This is better. Then we'll not analyze what was there on the screen a moment ago. Uh, yeah, and now depending on how the zero element behaves, this will immediately work or not work, but I can tell you it turns out fine. Um, cool. Now, summary of uh, summary of the algorithm then, maybe looking at a sequence like this one. You are given a sequence of few numbers, at least five numbers, at most thousands of them. Always you have two sequences, just keep them as vectors, and two discrepancies, the current one and the old one. Actually, the current one is a local variable, so whatever. So, for example, you say, oh, up to some position, and you also need to know that position. Uh, element was equal to the sum of previous two elements. You keep that as a vector minus one, 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 for the most convenient implementation. And then you have some new longer vector. You always evaluate, looking at new number, new index. If I multiply things by those coefficients, does the sum equal to zero? If so, then just continue. Otherwise, grab that old vector and subtract. Just be careful with indices. Right? If I had 1, 1, minus 1 here, and I had... Uh, I have what... Sorry, what I have is this, 2 and minus 1 with all decrease discrepancy equal to 10, and then 1, 1, minus 1 with new discrepancy equal to minus 20, if I'm not mistaken. Now, if you keep this as a vector and this as a vector, and you subtract one vector from the other with some multipliers, uh, then it's not that you do this, ai minus equal bi, you will instead do something like ai minus equal bi plus I know, difference of positions, some kind of shift. And sometimes you need to, because of that, resize a vector. Yes? Uh, that minus one, will we store it at the vector of zero for convenience or...? Uh, yes, usually I... not usually. In my code, vectors go from right to left, so minus one is the zeroth element. Uh, but it will just give you a different formula here and not much else is different. Uh, okay, and you continue doing this. Now, let's analyze time complexity. Let's say that we are given n elements and let's say that the linear recurrence that we'll find 
has a length of L. We know that L is short, smaller equal than N over 2, otherwise it wouldn't make much sense. We need to have enough equations. If you have 10 numbers and you're looking at linear recurrence of length 5, if you look at what kind of equations you will get, you will just barely get five equations. And, you know, five variables, you need five equations to get a solution, usually. Uh, so at least you need this, but let's say, uh, and I will transform this a little bit, I usually require that. This says that number of elements is enough to give you a solution for those L equations. Or, well, not really L equations, but for L variables. And there are five extra elements that will make sure that your formula is not really a coincidence. So I want this to be true. And what's the time complexity? What we do for every new position is we go through those previous elements and we multiply them with L coefficients, up to L coefficients. So for each of N indices, we will go through the previous L elements to evaluate. And that's it. The time complexity is n times l, which, like, even from this equation, you can say that it's, let's say, n squared. It can be faster if linear recurrence is very short. For example, if you provide 1,000 squares of numbers, 0, 1, 4, 9, up to 1,000 squared, uh, the linear recurrence formula will be very short, so the time complexity isn't really n squared. It's then n multiplied by 2 or 3, something very small. Uh, questions about the time complexity? Uh, fine. Now, we need to talk about how to use linear recurrence once we find it, and what kind of problems are solvable using that. We'll also go through my code, and we'll experiment a little bit with different sequences. Uh, I will, let's say, test your intuition what kind of sequences have linear recurrence, and which ones do not. Uh, how to use linear recurrence? Okay. Tell me a name for algorithm that solve this, solves this task quickly. Find n Fibonacci number. Let's say it. Quinary search. And the dynamic programming. I don't know how, I think you mean binary exponentiation, right? Yes. yes. So, either one of those two terms. Uh, now, luckily for us, we will not even need to do it. So, if you don't know really what is a matrix, or you don't know matrix exponentiation, that's fine. That being said, using binary exponentiation is, is very useful here. This is how you, for example, can compute quickly a to the bth power. If you're given two numbers, a, b up to a billion, and you need to compute a to the power b, modulo billion seven, let's say, uh, in logarithmic time, there is an algorithm for that. I will not explain it from scratch. Now, I can tell you, surprisingly, that we can compute n Fibonacci number a little bit faster in terms of time complexity. It's not really faster. It's still logarithmic, but we will not use matrices. Um, if you know a matrix solution for Fibonacci number, as, as a reminder, it's something like that. When we have two consecutive Fibonacci numbers, like A and B, then you can transform them like this. A transforms into B, B transforms into A plus B. Then this I can write as 0 times A plus 1 times B. And if you write down such a transformation, such a well, linear recurrence kind of, you grab those coefficients, you pretend that it's a matrix. Matrix here is 0, 1, 1, 1. Then what is needed is to raise this matrix to the nth power. And that works. Whatever. Some smart math, we don't want to use it. Because, by the way, with linear recurrence, we have something simpler than a matrix. We just have a vector. I will now show you the most useless thing ever, which is finding n Fibonacci number without matrices. Uh, the solution with matrices has time complexity log of n multiplied by 8. 
8 is how many multiplications you need to do to multiply two matrices. Uh, let's say that I will show you 4 times log of n. If we actually compute operations, it will not be 4, it will be still something close to 8. So it's not better, but it's interesting. And it's how we will use linear recurrence better. Okay. Uh, so there is formula. Fibonacci is the sum of previous two. Then there is also this formula. Fibonacci is equal to uh, 2 times the previous element, sorry, pre previous, plus 3 times, uh, not 1 time. formula, uh, in number from three indices ago. You can check that this formula works. And now I can use this formula recursively to figure out coefficients for fi is equal to something multiplied by fi minus four plus something times fi minus five. Then, as you can guess, I will get a formula for Fibonacci is equal to i minus eight times coefficient, plus i minus 9 times coefficient. If I continue doing that without matrices, but with something close to it, uh, then I will get a solution in logarithmic time, let's say, times 4 instead of times 8. Now, how do I get from this formula to the next one? I can just, as I said, use formula recursively. Let's once do it. Uh, okay, fi is equal to, now I know that this is, if I use this formula, 2 times fi minus 4 plus 1 times fi minus 5. So then this is 2 times 2fi minus 4 plus fi minus 5 plus this thing, again, recursively, I will use the same thing. 2 times fi minus 5 plus once fi minus 6. And now I want to simplify it. Plus, it bothers me a little bit that there is i minus 5, i minus 6, i minus 4. I want to represent always Fibonacci number as the sum of two old Fibonacci numbers, not three. Otherwise, it would keep growing exponential, uh, the length of such vector. But for that, once I can use the original Fibonacci formula. I can get rid of this term, or I can get rid of this term. Either one will work. Both things are possible in code, and depending on how you do it, the code looks a little bit different. Let's say that I will work this backwards a little bit. I know that this is uh, i minus 4 minus i minus 5, I think. This is fi minus 4 minus fi minus 5 because always the sum of two consecutive is the next one. So the whole thing is 4 times ai minus 4 plus 2 times fi minus 5 plus 2, this is 4 fi minus 5, then plus this thing. As I said, it's i minus 4 minus i minus 5, so we will get something like that. That's our new formula. You can, again, use this recursively to get i minus 8 and 9. It's not a coincidence that here we see 5 and 3. There is a formula for that. Fibonacci sequence satisfies so many different things. Uh, this is, I believe, f4. Maybe I'm off by 1, but uh, roughly this should be true. fi is equal to f, maybe I will say fn, fk times f n minus k plus f k plus 1 and minus k minus 1. I don't know if this is correct. You can for sure find it online. Maybe there is an off by one error. It doesn't matter to the lecture today because like, we are not trying to use it. I'm just telling you as an interesting fact that when you find such formulas for Fibonacci numbers, what you will get here as coefficients is always also Fibonacci numbers. Um, okay, then what's the way to use linear recurrences? When you have anything, 
like you have that ai is equal to three times ai minus one time plus some other coefficient times i minus two maybe minus seven times ai minus three you can just it boils down to multiplying vector by vector but you can use this formula recursively to insert it into every place or into at least the first place with that you will temporarily get something longer maybe you will get something times a i minus two something times a i minus three and so on plus few extra elements something times a i minus six you will temporarily get this long equation you want to shorten it down to just three elements and as i said depending on the implementation you will either get this or you will get here i minus four five six uh, let's say that this is what we have and here there was i minus one i minus two later you will get i minus four i minus eight and so on let's call this this is not really a good color it's difficult to see anyway let's call this vector exponentiation just like matrix just a little bit faster and it always consists of two parts uh, multiplying vector by itself and shortening it down to the same length l uh, multiple parts today might make you think about a smart math algorithm called FFT. Convolution is really what we are doing here when multiplying vector by itself. And I believe that all the steps of Bergkamp Massey and this vector exponentiation uh, can be uh, solved in n log n or so, but I never saw a task where that's needed. Maybe it's an educational practice, like if you train for ICPC, you can try to get Bergkamp Massey in n log n in your team reference document, but I always worked with quadratic solution and it was fine. Be just also because of constant factors. Uh, anyway, just with this thing. We had n times l solution for finding linear recurrence. And here, with this vector exponentiation, we have log of something, let's say k, or k is query, multiplied by L squared. And this also gets multiplied by the number of queries q. That's the full-time complexity of the following task. You are given first n elements of a sequence. You suspect, or eventually you realize, that it has linear recurrence of length L. Then, after you have those first few elements, you are given Q queries, each of them being, give me one billionth element on, of your sequence. Tell me a solution at index billion. Always when we are given K, index uh, of a number that we want to find, log K is for binary exponentiation, and it gets multiplied by L, or you can improve that with FFT and a little bit of math. Also, you can improve that. Uh, because when we check if the linear recurrence evaluates to zero at every next element, we can skip a lot of elements just by applying convolution. Not needed. I never used it in my life, and I solved a lot of tasks using Bergkamp mass. So I think you should also be fine with this time complexity. Questions? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't catch. Uh, we were talking about uh, speeding up the first part or the second part? Both. Both? Both, yeah. Uh, and it's not trivial. It's not as simple as just applying convolution, but it's possible. And the second part, maybe it could be done with uh, modding with a polynomial, but the first part, I don't, I mean, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> certain. It's described in code forces. Ah. <laughs> I, think. Uh, I don't know details. Uh, I, I will try maybe at the end of this lecture to find you a link so that you can read about it. I don't know if it's in blog by Adamant, mm -hmm. uh, as always, or somebody else. Uh, let's get back to this at the end of the lecture. I don't know how to do it faster uh, because I don't really know things like uh, I don't know, 
polynomial exponentiation and all that stuff with heavy map. Mm, okay. Now, code. Let's leave code for later. What's more interesting is solving tasks. Uh, so let's treat. Let's say that you find code online. For example, you can grab mine. I will send you in some way at the end of uh, this lecture. So we have a code that performs masse and in particular it does this vector exponentiation. The code, as you can see, is short. It's 100 lines total. And now let's focus on how to use it. Let's talk about problems where that's useful. Mm. Let's put here first a sequence. 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, uh, 64, 8100, I will never tell my program what this sequence is. It is supposed to figure it out. Then my way of using it is just that. And let's say return zero. Let's say that this is when we stop. Run this algorithm. Uh, run this algorithm. Uh, right now, my program just says how big linear recurrence it found. Uh, let's modify a little, little bit so it would tell us the coefficients. And I think they are somewhere here. For everything in coefficients, print the coefficient. Mm. Why? I didn't get anything. Uh, that's in get function. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. This is a very wrong place for that. Thank you. Uh, okay, we got this. And finally, we need to talk about some assumptions. At the beginning, I didn't tell you anything about numbers that we deal with. Maybe I only once used an, um, a word integer. My massa implementation told us three billion four one. Any guess why is it billion four and what it actually represents? Yes? Some modulo. Yeah. My modulo is billion seven, and this number actually represents minus three. When you work modulo anything, then there is no number minus one, there is modulo minus one. Uh, so this proper interpretation of this sequence is three minus three and my sorry, uh, is three minus three and I closed it no and one. I think I well, uh, before printing I already erased the minus one, uh, but I would interpret this as that minus three times ai minus two plus ai minus three, and let's check this using some numbers here, or let's plug it here to compute the next element. 3 times 121 minus 3 times 100 plus 81. I will just plug it to calculator. Plus 81. It's correct. I calculated it in my head. Oh. You're yeah, right. Yeah, congrats. Uh, 144, and that's this seems too much. 144 would be the next square. Uh, but what I can also do, and that's the more useful part, is I can print. I want Masse to tell me what's element at index well, 25, maybe 30, 30. This should be around 30 squared. And I think this should be exactly 30 squared. Or are we off by one? Yeah, it printed 900. If I here provide 50,000, then we will not get exactly 50,000 squared, because again, I used modulo. So this number, 499 something, this should be 50,000 squared modulo billion seven. Now, what are requirements about numbers? I would say that it's exactly the same as with Gaussian elimination, meaning 
that it can be any formally and it can be any field, for example, field of real numbers. Uh, but there are precision issues. Same with Gaussian elimination. If you have big and big enough, bigger than around 20, there will be huge precision issues if you work with doubles or long doubles. There, you can store fractions in perfect way in both Gauss and here, uh, but then those fractions would grow maybe even exponentially, I'm not sure. And there exists Berlkap masse alternative that is numerically stable and I think is polynomial, but I don't know it. It was never useful to me. Uh, this thing will not work properly for real values unless the sizes, the values are very, very small, like up to 10. I would even argue that in Gaussian elimination, the issue is smaller because we can use something like pivot. We always, in the next column, use the biggest number and this is what we use to eliminate everything else, to get, decrease it down to zero. That thing improves the precision a lot. Here, I'm not aware of any such trick. And if you any time make a mistake and you don't properly compare something to zero, you will get results that are completely wrong. It's not that the result will be a little bit off. No, it will be just well, completely different length and some crazy small or crazy big values. So don't use it for real values. Uh, usually you will use it in a field modulo some prime like billion seven. Uh, there was a case in that uh, bubble cap problem where modulo wasn't prime. I will connect. I will comment on that in a moment. Here I have billion seven. And then what's an example task that uh, that we can solve using massing? Let's get back to my stupid sequence from the beginning. This sequence. This sequence can be a result to some tasks, in particular the following. Consider n by n square grid. How many different domino pieces can you put there? One by two pieces. Not how many ways there are to do it, just how many can you fit. The answer is n squared divided by two. Just visualization of this trivial task. In n by n grid, how many two by one rectangles can you fit? In this case, I can fit four. And generally, the answer is n squared divided by two rounded down. But let's say that the task was actually way more complicated, or let's say that you actually have no idea how to solve it. But you can write a brute force. For a small n, you can create exponential brute force that will try all possibilities of placing those domino uh, pieces or tiles, and you compute the answer. And the algorithm tells you, for n equal to 1, the answer is 0. For n equal to 2, the answer is 1. For 3, it's 4. Uh, for 2, it's 2. And so on. Once you find enough values, once your brute force is run for n from 1 to, let's say, 10, maybe fewer will be enough, you can paste those values into as one vector into Bertelkamp masse, and it will tell you what is linear recurrence, if any. With some assert inside, you can check if uh, that inequality is true. I told you earlier, it's something like 2L is smaller than n minus 5. I'm using this assert in my code to check that the last five elements are already correct. I found some linear recurrence and the last five elements do not change anything, they only confirm. It's a simplification what I've just said, let's say that. And then, without solving the task, without figuring out a proper formula, just using brute force and copy-pasting Massey, you can ask it to give you one billionth element, the answer to any big n. This wasn't really a good example because it was very simple. And somewhere, I think in this unpublished block, I have maybe a list of problems. No, not that. Uh, yeah, we'll go through this in a moment. But uh, the most important, or the most common type of problems is the following. 
Uh, let me think. Count domino placements in in a grid, in a rectangular grid, with the following constraints. Uh, what I mean here is how many different ways there are to put one by two rectangles on a grid. Obviously, you can leave some spaces empty. If you are experienced in competitive programming, you should be able to solve that in not really perfect, but in some time complexity with matrix exponentiation. I will not explain that though. If, if you know how to do it, great. If not, then it's difficult to explain. Uh, that being said, one sign that you should use Bergkamp masse is if you're tempted to solve it with matrix exponentiation. Now, we are given two values in the input, but one of them is always small and the other one is big. We want to get rid of that. We want to do something here. Also a visualization for that. Uh, so there is a grid, small width, possibly huge height. And you want to count model abelian 7, how many ways there are to place some one by two domino pieces here. This is one possibility. And there are a lot, a lot more. For small enough h, you can create some brute force. The best brute force here will be so-called broken profile. You can read about it in CP algorithms. Uh, it's some kind of DP with, in, with a bit mask as one of dimensions. Again, I will not explain because that's not the point. There is a solution that will handle that for h up to 100 or so. And that's important. This is our brute force. It's, we can argue whether we can call it brute force because it's already quite smart, but it's not enough. What, so what we do is, we, for the given w, we iterate every h from 1 to 100. For each of those, we run brute force. Actually, we could run brute force once and just tell us partial answers. Anyway, we get 100 values. And those are answers. Let's say that we, the question is, solve this. This width, this height. Then I'm solving this for 7 by 1, for 7 by 2, 7 by 3, up to 7 by 100. I get 100 values. I plug that into Masse. Masse either will fail an assert and it will tell me no linear recurrence found, or it will be able to very, very quickly give me the answer for this h. And problem solved. Sometimes there is an alternative solution, uh, like matrix exponentiation, and sometimes Masse is the fastest way to do it. Yes. I think that uh, when we think about what that DP will look like, uh, it's kind of just looking at the pre previous state and the, then uh, uh, the previous two states and then uh, linearly assign linear. All the operations in the DP will be linear. That could be some uh, sort of an intuition, I guess. Yes, this is an, even an intuition for when we can use matrix exponentiation. I will explain that using simpler examples in a moment. Uh, okay. Do you have some questions maybe about what I said? Is there some part that I can explain again? Yes. Yeah, um, I'm just curious, have you encountered problems where it's actually important not to use Gauss? Because for all of these, well, the examples you've listed, like, you'll need like maybe a sequence of length 10 or something, so like Gauss would be enough for the final. Here it's not length 10. Here the length will be a few hundreds. Oh, okay. Uh, and I guess that no. would still probably if you run it like locally on the 10 values, it would still be okay with Gauss. Oh, yeah. And it's always about constraints, right? Because Gauss can solve such tasks, it's just slower. So first way to break it, it will be here to put 15. Sure. Uh, second, if you want to do it locally, is there can be modulo given in the problem statement. So the task can give you W, H, and also prime value P yeah. up to a billion. Uh, I'm now saying those things from the perspective of problem setter. Sometimes maybe I want Masse to be the intended solution, sometimes not. And will there ever be examples where just 
recurrence is way too long to a linear number. Uh, can you repeat the question? That the linear recurrence may be too long even for. Oh yes, uh, yes. Uh, for like usually that's the case that there is no short linear recurrence. So this is much more of a let me try and see. You cannot be sure. I will give you some intuition now. Um, okay. Now let's talk about when do we usually use matrix exponentiation? And again, you don't need to know what that is. But we use it when there is a solution, there is a DP solution with few states. Or in other words, DP solution with small memory, small space complexity. When you think that something like this exists, usually matrix exponentiation will work, and usually also Bernard massey will work. Here's an example. Mm. Oh, and uh, that, that also works for Fibonacci numbers. You can compute n Fibonacci number without big memory usage, just by maintaining two consecutive variables. And then the next variable will be the previous one, uh, the previous two summed up, and you forget one of them. So you can just maintain two variables and modify them to two new variables. So I claim that there is linear recurrence of length two. That's not, it's not always as simple, uh, but that's, it's correct here. Uh, another example. Mm, I recognize, I remember such a problem from ICPC that uh, there is a long row, or two rows actually, and you start here. You always move to the right by one, and you have some probability of switching rows. So you will always move here, and po possibly with some probability you will also switch row to a different one. And then from this column you move to the right by one, and with some probability you go up. Let's say for a moment that you know, probability provided in the statement is one third. In the input you are given width up to one billion. And you need to compute the probability that in the last column you will be in the top row. Maybe modulo billion seven, and maybe using real values. However, we could handle that. Uh, what's the DP solution in small memory? I can compute probability that I'm here, that's one, and probability that I'm here, that's zero. And using those, I can compute probabilities that I'm here or there. Two variables. Right? Then I will move to two variables here. The transition from here to there with those probabilities will be something to do with P. If I'm here, then we, in one third probability I'm there, with two thirds I'm here. So the formula is something like this probability is equal to this times two thirds plus this times one third. This is still linear recurrence, the sum of values multiplied by coefficients. Uh, and I can continue doing so. So we have dp with small memory, which means that we can use matrices or that we can use Bernkamp Massey. Uh, how we can use Bernkamp Massey? I can use my dp to get probabilities to get you know, here, there, there, there. You can even include cell zero. Then you will get some series of values, series of probabilities. Let's say for a moment real values. And you want to plug that into Massey, and you want it to tell you the linear recurrence, because it will exist. And then compute value for very big width, W. But we cannot really do real values. I told you that there, is, there are huge precision issues. First, for something as small as one third, and here if we only go up to fifth column or so, maybe seventh column, I think that we should be fine. But second, we can use computations modulo billion seven, and we can ask Massey locally for the coefficients. So one third you can turn into value modulo billion seven, which is like you can compute inverse of three. One third modulo billion seven is equal to something. 
it's a huge number, a few hundred thousand. You can use that yeah. and do all the computations, model of billion seven, and Masse still will find linear recurrence, and it will tell you something like uh, answer of i is equal to uh, four times answer of i minus one uh, plus something crazy times answer of i minus two or so. It, it doesn't matter. Yeah, sure. sure, it exists. Uh, but this is not really useful for us. I cannot use it to then submit to the task because I want a real value. Here's the thing though. For small enough data and for simple enough statement and fraction provided, this is not a random number. This always comes from something. This is a small fraction, just modulo billion seven. So you can write another brute force or brute force inside of your printing of coefficients to try to represent that as a fraction, a divided by b. Just try a lot of different small a and b's. Also, it might be negative, so try minus a divided by b. For each of them, check if this fraction is equal to that. And again, if the problem is simple enough, you will find something like that. And maybe here it will turn out that this is actually minus 2 divided by 7. And then you can grab those real values and you can implement a matrix or vector exponentiation using real values. The precision issues happen in bergkamp masse part where we try to figure out the linear recurrence, just like in Gauss. But once we know it, actually there won't be any issues with precision when computing nth answer. Yes. Is it possible that multiple fractions will give the same answer? Uh, if you try all possible a, b's up to billion, yes. If you try values up to 50, unlikely. I guess you can try another p. You can, but it's, it's not needed. Either this will work for small a, b, or that's not a way to solve the problem. Uh, yeah, so this is how you can cheat very, very rarely. That's not a typical task, even if modulo, prime modulo isn't mentioned in the problem statement. Mm -hmm. Also, it might be useful when uh, it seems that the problem statement will require you to use big integers. Let's say that the task says compute n Fibonacci number without any modulo. Just n is small enough that you will be able to print it. What you can do is, say locally, uh, compute it modulo billion seven, get coefficients, and then plug it into that vector exponentiation without using modulo there. That's viable sometimes. Um, okay, let's go through this thing. Uh, maybe this part I will just read. Uh, when we use Bergkamp massing, let's say that there is one huge value in the input. Usually it's just one, k okay, up to 10 to 18th or k to 9. What you can solve is the task where k is small, up to a few hundreds, maybe a few thousand at most. Then for each such k you want to find the answer, either locally or maybe after submitting, if there is more data, more stuff in the problem input. Then plug that into Bradkamp Masse and hopefully it finds linear recurrence. Uh, when you have some, uh, regarding choosing this number, if you don't want to think too much, just choose whatever will fit in time limit. You don't need to analyze, do you need 10 numbers or 1000 numbers so it would find the answer. Just think how much you will manage in time limit and use that. That's one approach. That being said, usually you can estimate it better. Uh, then once there, this preprocessing pre is over, if that was run locally, you need to maybe plug those coefficients into code. Uh, but usually it's not really a slow part. And then you will be able to find that huge answer for this huge k in logarithmic time multiplied by L squared. When we know that Bergkamp Masse will work or when you should consider it. First, when you know that sequence is computed using linear recurrence, for example, Fibonacci numbers. And so 
if you're given formula similar to Fibonacci and you want to find nth element, that's something. Second, when the sequence is related to polynomials, like i element is equal to 3 i to 5th power minus i4 and so on, or even more complicated, something with model or division might be there. So I already told you that ai is equal to i squared divided by 2 floor works. Uh, finally, it's a DP problem solvable with matrix expo. Again, you don't need to figure out a matrix. I will comment on this a little bit more. Uh, there is a theorem that talks about it. It's called Cayley Hamilton. Yep. So in competitive programming, we have two different matrix multiplication exponentiations. We have the one in math and the other one is like the binary one. Is it possible to read some node from some node in the graph? So does it work in both matrices or only in the first one? Uh, this thing will always compute the number of ways. So if the task says, check if it's possible to do something, what you can do is count the number of ways to do it and then check if it's not zero. Of course, computing it modulo billion seven is slightly dangerous because maybe something is divisible by billion seven. But usually it's about counting. I can imagine a problem where the answer is yes, no, and we use Berlkamp Massey, but I don't recall a single one like that. Uh, okay, a little bit of math. Uh, Cayley Hamilton theorem says that a matrix is a solution to its polynomial, characteristic polynomial, uh, which sounds fancy, but in short, it means the following. For any matri matrix M, there are coefficients. Uh, let's say that there is matrix M that is of size n by n. Or in other words, it's not really equivalent, but there is matrix M of order n. Then there exists coefficients that the following is true. Meaning, if you have a matrix 5 by 5, and you write down this matrix to the 0th power, 1st, 2nd, 4th, 3rd, 4th, then some linear combination of them is equal to m to the 5th power. And this will also be true if you raise all those exponents by 1. If you multiply both sides of equation by m, you will have here m plus 1, here 1, 2, and so on. Because of that, uh, and because of that, anything that is solvable with matrices, if we also use this thing, uh, it says that there is this linear recurrence. There are those coefficients. And once again, we don't even need to know it. We don't need to understand this, this theorem. I don't know if it implies anything more or if it describes some way of finding it. It's just that this is true. And the, yeah, well, it mentions that those coefficients, they form a characteristic polynomial, or at least that's a name in Polish. I think it's monic polynomial. And not, not that. I'm not sure. A characteristic polynomial, yeah, that, that's a proper term. So there for sure is a, some way of saying that linear recurrence related to matrix exponentiation will have in particular linear recurrence in form of this characteristic polynomial whatever, some math words. Uh, now, if you are tempted to solve something with matrices, if you know that you would create a matrix of size S by S, then usually you're aiming at this time complexity, logarithm of K times S cubic with matrix expo, then instead, you don't even need to find this matrix, you just need to find values for small K. Uh, so find at least n, 2 times s plus 5 answers. If matrix is 100 by 100, then you need to find 205 answers, let's say. Then Massey will work in s squared, or, or so, n times s. And then every query you can answer in log k times s squared. This is a little bit better than that. 
Um, or, in other words, not really other words, because it's a different thing. If there is DP solution in small spa space complexity using just x states, then there is linear recurrence of size at most x. One last hint or signal to check if there is any chance that a sequence will be uh, solvable with bergkamp masse You can look at ratio AI divided by AI minus 1, and if there is an upper limit to that, there is hope, otherwise no hope. It needs to be at most exponential, like 2 to i-th power. So this ratio needs to have upper limit, otherwise don't even try. Example, a n is equal to 3 to nth power. Does this have a linear recurrence formula? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Every element is three times the previous element. And also there is a constant ratio. A n divided by a n minus 1 is limited. It's lower equal than some constant. Another example, a n is equal to n to third power. Is there a linear recurrence formula? Yes or no? Yes. yes. I told you earlier today that things related to polynomials usually have such a linear recurrence. And again, there is a limit this time. A, a, starting from some moment, this g actually ten, um, converges to 1. But again, I can say this. And so, If it's polynomial, there is linear recurrence formula. If it's very simple exponential, again, there, there is formula. Here's something different though. n to nth power. Is there a linear recurrence formula? No. Why? Because, uh, well, it's time to run an example formula. <laughs> <laughs> That's good thinking. I need to sometimes during my lectures three times in a row show the yes answer. The ratio is not limited. If you see how quickly this grows, like fifth element will be at least five times bigger from fourth element, then six times bigger or, or even more and so on and so on. It keeps growing faster and faster. There is no limit to that. And why do we even look at this ratio? Because of what linear recurrence is. It says something like a n is equal to 7 times a n minus 1 plus 10 times a n minus 2 and so on. So there is a limit to growth. This is at most 17 times the bigger of the previous two elements. And this is a constant that we want to hold forever. So for this to be true, the ratio would need to be at most 17 and 17 times 2, something like that. Uh, okay, next thing. A n is equal to, maybe I will write that because that's easier. A n is n prime number. Is there a linear recurrence or not? Uh, no, I think that it's not the prime numbers were well, like really bad. Uh, I think, I think we are like, well, the ratio t I think converges to one. Usually, gaps between prime numbers are around log of n between two, two prime numbers around n. So that's not a proper explanation, but the answer is correct. Yes. Uh, no, because there is no formula for prime numbers. That's that's one valid explanation. Linear recurrence implies that there is a polynomial formula. If there is no formula for something. Uh, well, no, what I said is not true, it's not polynomial, because we shouldn't call, uh, we shouldn't call this a polynomial, it's not polynomial of n, so forget that, but there is no formula, it's too irregular. What about that? A of n is n times n divided, floor of n divided by 2, modulo 7, plus n times n plus n. 
let's do a vote. What do you think about that? Who thinks that there is a linear recurrence formula for this? It's like this, then modulo 7. Hand up if you think that there is a formula. And hand up if you think there is no linear recurrence formula. Okay. I, my first intuition to, well, after I learned Massey was that there shouldn't be a formula. Come on. It's, I mean, n over 2 appeared today, but we have modulo 7. But, well, flooring n divided by 2 apparently wasn't an issue earlier. Then why would something related to division by 7 or modulo 7 uh, be different? And the answer is that, yes, there is a linear recurrence formula. So congratulations to the first half of people, because the votes were kind of half-half, 50-50. And the answer, or an, ex an explanation, sentence that explains it a little bit, is the following. Linear recurrence will just find a pattern that relates every number to something that was 7 indices earlier, and 14 indices earlier, and so on. Think about this sequence. 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 4, 0, 0, 9, 0, 0, 16, and so on. You see a pattern here. It's square every three indices. Just like earlier, there was a linear recurrence that says a number depends on the previous three numbers or so. Here, Masse will find formula that says a number depends on the previous nine numbers. So here, my guess is that it will find something like linear recurrence of length 14, maybe 21. It will require numbers that are 7 indices ago, 14, and so on. Likely, there will be a lot of zeros in between. Uh, do I have more examples here? No. Uh, I factorial is also a good one. A n is equal n factorial. This is slightly smaller or slower growing than n to the nth power, but the same holds. Uh, ratio is not limited. It keeps growing faster and faster, so no solution. Okay, uh, let's talk about um, an old bubble cap problem. I wonder if I can quickly find it. It's this, just with different constraints. Uh, I, I think that in Bubble Cup it was traveling night six or so, but I remember from searching for that two years ago or so, this problem was for some reason erased from Sphere Online Judge. So dif more difficult version of this task was here as a Bubble Cup qualification problem, but I think it's a different one here, right? Uh, why is oh constraints are here? Oh, sorry, never mind. This is this is the problem. N up to twenty four. Okay. Uh, then it's the one I was talking about. It is it's, I guess it's different from Aztec Gold, right? I remember one more about where modulo was ten thousand something. Aztec treasure. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, then I don't know this one. I, I remember one more from Bubble Cup. Uh, but it's not this one. Anyway, what do we have here? Your task is simple. A knight is placed on the top left corner of a chessboard, having two n rows and two n columns. I don't know why it was even... Uh, it would also work if this was odd. In how many ways can it move such that it ends up at a corner after at most k moves? It doesn't matter that much that it's corners. 
in a grid, chess knight moves in some pattern, and we want to count the number of ways from some cell to some cell, or a set of cells. And the constraints are like that. There are a few test cases. K, which is length of the path, how many moves the knight will perform is up to a billion. And size of the chessboard is up to 48. It's double N, so 48. Um, we need to compute the answer modulo uh, 1 million 7. And 1 million 7 is the product of. Wait, wait. Oh, yeah. The product of those two. So, first trick here. This is prime, this is prime, and we want to find the answer model of the product of them. What do we use? Chinese remainder theorem? Yes. Chinese remainder theorem. If you have a product of few primes and you know remainders model each of them, you can figure out the remainder model of the product. I don't know a solution if this, if this model was of any form with some primes raised to a power. So as long as you're interested in something like get me the answer modulo 5 times 7 times 11, fine. You can use Bertkamp masse three times and then Chinese remainder theorem, but as long as uh, if it's say 5 squared, there is no solution, or at least I don't know how to solve it. Um, but let's focus on just solving it modulo billion 7. We have, first of course, we'll talk about DP. So we have some grid, a knight starts somewhere, and then it moves according to some pattern. For every cell, I, my goal will be to know the number of paths or number of ways to get there after some number of steps. And this is solvable with DP that uh, says how many moves were performed, in what row, in what column, and this DP will be how many ways there are to be after that many moves in this row, in this column. And there are some simple transitions for that. You don't need to keep this as, like, you can save memory by erasing this dimension. So just for every number of moves, you can keep such a DP. This has size, let's say, 50 squared. Let's say that uh, this is 50 by 50. 50 squared, which is around 2,000. And uh, it means the following. We can already solve the task if in this time complexity, cubic, using matrix exponentiation. So that many states, I will put a name here, A. A is memory complexity of our dynamic programming solution. Then first solution that we have is this. Uh, so 50 to the sixth power, and this will be few billion times logarithm of k times t, because there are test cases. But because it's matrix, uh, it's something to do with matrices, we can run Bertelkamp masse after solving this using dp for smaller k. So let's say we do that, we run that dp, we run dp once and we capture all the answers for, uh, for k up to 1000 or so. We plug that into Massey, and surprisingly, Massey will tell you that linear recurrence is very short compared to what we expect. This thing is around 2000, so matrix size is 2500 by 2500, and the only thing that we know for sure so far is that linear recurrence will be 2500 or shorter, but I claim it will be way, way shorter. We don't need to understand it to solve the task, but maybe it's good to analyze this. How can we save memory in dynamic programming here? If you, after let's say five steps, if I write down how many ways there are to get to every cell, maybe three ways here, four, four, seven, eight, and so on, maybe here zero, how do we save memory? Time. It is symmetric by the diagonal. Exactly. There is a symmetry here if this is a square grid and we started from top left corner. Uh, so 
at least, then I claim this, there exists dynamic programming solution with number of states equal to 1,200 something. We do if we don't start from top left corner, but we can go backwards. The problem statement said that we want to end in any one of corners, so we can think backwards. Let's say that at the beginning I am in one of the corners, so there is one way to get here. Then, indeed, there are more symmetries, because there is this diagonal, this diagonal, and that's it. This is also symmetrical like that, but I don't know if this is redundant. Anyway, I believe that it's enough to keep this triangle of values in DP. And it would be a lot of work in DP, but likely we don't need to do it. We just know that such DP exists. So actually I claim this is what, one eighth of the grid and everything else is symmetrical, so there exists a linear recurrence of size, at most, one-eighth of that, and that's around 300. Now I claim that L is at most 300 or so. <clears throat> so also DP, we need to run for 605 iterations. I want to get values for K up to 605, which is already nice. Uh, so let's say that's done. If, if needed, we can do it locally. Uh, but then, what's the time complexity of the remaining part? We have t test cases or queries multiplied by log k multiplied by l squared. And I recall that it was too slow. What was t? T is 50. I think that T was bigger. and it, it, Because here it seems that 300, uh, 300 squared multiplied by all of this seems fine. But I recall that this task was far from over here. And this was too big. I, we needed to get something faster, at least by constant factor. And then, just like with Matrix Expo, you can here do some tricks. Uh, what we want is we want to raise a vector to some power, whatever that means. How you multiply vector by itself is possibly a black box. But let's say that you compute this vector, the linear recurrence of size 300, then you can pre-process and you can save this vector to few powers, maybe just powers of two. So you can save uh, second, fourth, eighth, and so on, but you can save a little bit more. For example, let's say, before us answering test cases or queries, I save this. I also save V2 300, V2 400. What I'm saying also applies to matrix expo and also applies to computing powers. For a moment, you can assume something like that. You are given number A and Q queries. Each query is compute A to the power K given K. Using binary exponentiation, we can do it, of course, separately, but it's slightly faster to pre-process and remember some powers. At least remember a to the first power, a to the second, maybe even up to a to the 100,000 power. Remember all of them. Then remember a to 200,000, a to 300,000. And if you do that up to a billion, then I can tell you that every query you can answer using just one multiplication. Yeah, that, that, that I gave up the same problem on the, on the one of the rounds. Here you go. Yeah. A, a well-known technique, just here using powers. We can use the same for matrices or here vectors. So what was required uh, to pass the bubble cap task was, well, first to use Massey uh, with Chinese remainder theorem to pre-process some stuff um, on your computer and paste a lot of values to code to make it faster. And finally, to play around with those powers that you pre-process so that every query you could answer very fast. 
it's just a combination of a lot of techniques. Uh, I don't know if it was this task or something else, but also from Bubble Cup, where I, um, I also tried to fit a lot of data in my code. So sometimes you need to you know, use characters to code data. If you have a lot of numbers, you want to paste them into code, but you hit source code limit, you can compress it a little bit better to use bigger alphabet. Uh, there is even a way to use all, the whole alphabet, tw 256 characters, uh, but it, I think it's called lit literal string. C++, if, if you're into that. Yeah, raw string literal. You can read about that if you want to be very efficient about how you compress data into your code. And then it really can be anything. Uh, you don't use and you don't lose anything uh, okay so you have traveling night too you can solve that later you can also in code forces go to my blog for matrix exponentiation and if you open this blog it will teach you about matrices and uh, you can go to this gene where the tasks are made for matrices, you can solve them with matrices, and you can this way also learn more about what kind of tasks are solvable this way. But you can test your masse as well for this series of tasks, not all of them, because some of them are not really about counting the number of ways. Uh, still try to solve as many as you can with masse. The first one will be very similar to the task about switching with probability P. Here it's about mood, but equivalently it's this grid 2 by W. Uh, okay, we still need to go through my code. Any questions before that? If not, then let's see the code. Uh, I will send you the code in some form. I'm not sure what way is the easiest, but you will get my code and you can use it. Just put, when you use it in contest, put a comment that it's made by me. And obviously, it's more educational if you try to implement it. it this is an old code. I'm sure it doesn't follow good coding practices or anything like that. Oh, first, let's see code that is meant to be easier to understand. And it's here. This is massing. Very short code. We get a vector of numbers of size n. We uh, create two vectors, <laughs> apparently minus one and one, not just both the same. I don't remember why, but it works. And we keep, and we know all the discrepancy. Uh, I even here wrote a comment, initial value doesn't matter, because surprisingly, if you replace this value with like 12 or anything, it will still work. It's complicated why that's the case. Always when I get back to implementing Massey or trying to understand it, there are some places that I'm not sure about regarding, initia in regarding initialization of values, and I need to think for like 15 minutes to convince myself that indeed it's okay and it doesn't matter too much. Whatever. We go through all the elements given to us, indices from 0 to n minus 1, and we evaluate the new discrepancy. We go through the current linear recurrence, vector cur current. We add up coefficients with those elements. Uh, in is the same as a, it's just a typo. And if d is equal to 0, continue. If linear recurrence works here, go to the next element. Otherwise, remember the current linear recurrence as a vector. Why do we do that? Because in a moment, that will be the old linear recurrence that stopped working and will be useful for us to fix a future linear recurrence. So you have this new linear recurrence that stopped working, save it to a side. Also, you will need at some point to sell, save your old discrepancy. Uh, somewhere it should happen, I think, here and compute the ratio. As I told you, we need to multiply one vector by some ratio to add to the other. 
do a resize. You have two vectors, you need to sometimes resize one of them to fit the other. Sometimes it resizes by zero, that's possible. And subtract one equation from the other, or one vector from the other. Then update the best old linear recurrence. And now, this if is very tricky. Depending on the source online, you will find it in a different form. But here's the easiest way to explain this. You want an old linear recurrence that starts rightmost. I, sh I earlier created a drawing that shows that. Among the linear recurrences that stopped working in the past, we want the one that starts rightmost. Whether it means the most recent that stopped working is slightly complicated. And in short, that's because sometimes linear recurrence of some length stops working, but we will manage to fix it and still it has the same length. So we have linear recurrence of length 4. We shift it to the right, doesn't work. We fix it, it still has length 4. So, and then uh, this linear recurrence a moment ago, possibly it has very, the start is too much to the left. And something that we used to fix it might be better so we don't replace. It would be incorrect here to always say, I'm replacing my old linear recurrence. Now the visualization of this fact. This is your current linear recurrence. This is an old one that stopped working, maybe to make it better. This is the old one. Old, current. Now you shift it by one, doesn't work. But you manage to subtract the blue one uh, with some multiplier and it now suddenly works. So actually, yeah, this works. It's the same as white, just a slightly modified. And now what I claim is this. Red, should, blue shouldn't be replaced with red, even though this is the most recent linear recurrence that didn't work and it has non-zero discrepancy. So we could use it to fix future things. This is better. So the if is equivalent to compare those two left endpoints. Uh, maybe I will be able to answer in like half a minute, give me a moment. But I think the answer is, I agree that in, it's not intuitive, still it's possible. <coughs> and I think that it's possible uh, and it's related to the first few elements. So it's a little bit crazy what happens at the beginning, where Um, you are right, but I don't know if it answers the question fully. Uh, that we can get the same length, but the question was, is it possible that that old thing, how did we get the white thing that starts earlier than the blue thing? That, that's the question. But maybe, hopefully, one of drawings here uh, shows it. This shows where there is a pie, yeah. and that, that's obvious, sure. But yeah, I feel like pie is like the, gym, like the most common thing, right? Okay. They are going to start yeah. in the same place. 
Okay. I once had the same question and I don't remember the answer. Sure. I mean, so, yeah. I'm sure about this implementation that I'm showing because it works. I don't remember if it's possible uh, that the old one starts more to the right. Anyway, <coughs> oh, and uh, one more thing is that this if online you will find in few different forms that are equivalent, uh, but still it boils down to comparing left endpoints. Uh, finally, when, once we are out of all the elements, we need to erase minus one from the vector to just leave coefficients, and we can optionally put the assert to make sure that we had enough elements and we are quite certain about the correctness. Uh, and then this code with module operations uh, will be like that. Oh, and a good, an important advice I would say is the following. Make your masse in such a way in ICPC team reference document that there is just very short code for me, it's 20 lines that you can write during a contest just to check if linear recurrence exists. All this part about saving the coefficients, using them to get billion element, you need only if linear recurrence exists. So don't always write the full 100 lines or so. Write only what's necessary for your task. Run it for the sample test or whatever, for some test. Check if Masse tells you that linear recurrence exists. And if it doesn't, don't waste more time. Maybe check if you rewrote it properly. Okay. I, I even This is my code that I think I used in ICPC finals. And I have here things like three optional lines start here and write the next 25 lines until stop then somewhere here there is stop and everything after that i rewrite only once the first part confirms yeah there is linear recurrence finish it and get accepted uh, so what is massey we have two vectors i don't remember why here i have one one and there i had minus one one i'm sorry those codes are five years old uh, for every element Ignore the assert. Insert zero at the beginning. This is a trick for more convenient um, implementation. Let me explain. You see this vector for, or let's say this vector, two minus one. I will erase that. When we shift to the right to make it easier to compare vectors and to add them side by side, what I did is I added fake zeros here and there. And thanks to adding fake zeros, now when you add two vectors, you can just do it index by index. So always when I shift by right to by one to the right, I insert zero at the beginning of the old vector. Just an implementation trick. Insert zero at the beginning, compute this discrepancy. If it's zero, then continue. Uh, then create a new vector resize it to maximum of sizes of two vectors because now you just have two vectors add them side by side and i still think that the endpoints are not necessarily in one configuration because i had a reason to here put max instead of just one of them so apparently either can be longer uh, for every element subtract one minus equal the other multiplied by ratio and here you can see that i don't divide there, this is another trick for efficiency. I only multiply by discrepancy times something. How can I not divide? Well, I just divide in a different place. And that's here. Oh, and this is equivalent way of writing the if. Just very difficult to understand that. It turns out that it's equivalent to this. Two times current length is smaller or equal than current n, how many elements we took. So if you went for a prefix of size 10, and your current linear recurrence if is of size four, then your correction means that you're doing better. And if current linear recurrence is of length six, then it's worse. I'm not going to analyze that now. I would need a lot of time to understand it. Whatever. I prefer the if that I showed you earlier. Uh, and when saving a vector, I multiply it by inverse of the discrepancy. So this is equivalent to the following. Uh, 
I once told you that second equa equation, we subtract first equation multiplied by something like new discrepancy divided by old. Apparently, I wanted to avoid computing this ratio later. I don't know why it doesn't really matter where we do it. So what I saved is this as a whole. I saved the old equation multiplied by the inverse of old. Don't know why. I think it's equally fast. And then when I see the new equation and I'm fixing that, this old vector I'm just multiplying by the new discrepancy and subtracting that. Uh, okay, after you find this, print the length of linear recurrence that you find, put some assert, apparently here I, I just used n minus 2, not even n minus 5. And then, if you want to later get nth element, save your coefficients somewhere. And my code here is slightly more complicated than necessary because it already saves the, a lot of vectors like that. I think just powers of 2. So it's meant to be fast if possible. Then I have two functions that are related to uh, multiplying vectors somewhere here. You can replace that with convolution. Uh, yeah, this is function to multiply two vectors and shorten it. This first part is just convolution. And then second part is shortening it down to length L. Then we use it somehow here with binary exponentiation. Later, of course, you can read this code uh, like on your own. And then the usage is obvious or trivial. It's just that. Um, we can test the thing I told you. So for every element, let's add, what was that? I multiplied by I divided by 2 modulo 7. Maybe it was more complicated. And I want to know what's the length of linear recurrence. Length apparently is 16. I don't know why it's exactly 16, but it was intuitive for me that it should be 7 multiplied by a little bit, and apparently it doesn't need the last few elements. Length of linear recurrence here is 16, which also means that you can solve this with matrices of size 16, but it will be extremely difficult to figure that out. Do you have any questions? Uh, okay, I will figure out with organizers how I can send you my code. And as I told you, you can do tasks from my code forces matrix exponentiation block. And you can try this traveling night to a uh, Sphere Online Judge. Thank you for your attention. If you have more questions to me, maybe after the lecture. Thank you.